Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Indiana has one of the country's lowest COVID vaccination rates. Ahead, the state's latest push to encourage people to get the shot. Having this vaccine available will ensure that counties and local health departments can administer vaccine to all ages. Some local governments acted swiftly this week to reinstate mask orders and other COVID restrictions after the state legislature approved a law to nullify the existing orders imposed by county health departments. The state's wrong and um, I'm glad that you're doing the right thing. A Bloomington North grad who was already a best-selling author is now making his mark on Hollywood. To watch her become the character that I had been imagining was um, it's really, really a special thing. Coming up, Michael Carita sits down with us to talk about his latest film starring Angelina Jolie. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines, right now on Indiana yeah. News oh, Desk. Oh, yeah. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. A return to normalcy from the pandemic took a huge step forward yesterday when the CDC announced that fully vaccinated people no longer need to wear masks or socially distance even inside. The move comes after the Pfizer vaccine was approved for 12 to 15 year olds earlier this week. The state has begun shipping the Pfizer vaccine to the 30 counties in Indiana that did not currently have sites that offer that brand. Indiana will also make the Pfizer vaccine available at all of its mobile clinics. State Health Commissioner Dr. Chris Box says getting your child vaccinated can make life easier. If they do get exposed to COVID-19, they're not going to have to be quarantined. They don't have to miss school. They don't have to worry about not getting to do their athletic events. Monroe County's mass vaccination site at IU's Assembly Hall distributes the Pfizer vaccine. Monroe County will continue to enforce COVID-19 health restrictions after the state legislature overrode the veto of a bill that stripped local health officials from issuing such restrictions. Pat Bean reports. A little foresight by the Monroe County commissioners meant there was no disruption in local COVID-19 health restrictions this week following the actions of the state legislators. The new law requires county commissioners to vote to approve any county health orders issued during emergencies that are more stringent than the state guidelines. Anticipating passage of the bill and likely veto override, the commissioners voted two weeks ago to extend the mask mandate and limit on crowd sizes through May 28th. The state's wrong, and um, I'm glad that you're doing the right thing and that we can support you. The commissioners voted Wednesday on a public appeals process that will take place before any future votes on health restrictions. They've set parameters uh, for what they will hear and what they won't hear. Um, but they have to have that process because that's the other layer of this. I mean, Senate Bill 5 has a lot of layers, um, including making the appointment of the health officer more of a political one. Cottle and others are concerned those added layers will slow down implementing new restrictions. And that just increases the likelihood that something in a, in a pandemic specifically um, could get out of hand and grow before we have a chance to respond to it. Indianapolis will also keep its restrictions in place, but the vote by city officials there was strictly along party lines, adding a political element to the decision making. Most boards don't always agree on issues, so it, it could be left in the hands of electeds instead of the scientists who are, are more qualified really to judge what to do. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Pat Bean. Tippecanoe County officially rescinded its remaining COVID-19 restrictions on Wednesday, joining a number of counties in the state. 
This was the second veto the General Assembly has overturned this session. Mitch Legan joins us now to discuss. This isn't the first time the governor and legislature have wrestled over their powers. Hi, Mitch. Hey, Joe. Yeah, no, I spoke with uh, University of Indianapolis Professor James Fuller this week, and he says this kind of fight over power is really reminiscent of what we last saw during the Civil War. Of course, things were a lot more heated then than they were now. So what were they arguing over? Who was governor? So Republican Oliver Morton becomes governor in 1861, right before the war begins. But he knows things are trending toward war, so he starts preparing the state, gathering guns and ammo and creating a state militia. But when he's doing this, he's centralizing a lot of power in the governor's office. And you know Hoosiers, Joe, this isn't something they're particularly comfortable with, so it leads to a Democratic wave in the state legislature in 1863. They set out to pass a series of laws that came together under the Militia Act, they called it. And this Militia Act was going to take control of the war effort away from the governor and give it to the legislature. So, Mitch, do they pass it? No. So the Republicans actually don't show up to session. So the Democrats don't have a quorum. Uh, so the Militia Act doesn't pass, but neither does the state budget. So there's no money to run the state for the next two years. The Democrats think they've got Morton right where they want him. They'll have to call a special session, and then they'll pass the Militia Act and the state budget. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't call him back into session, and he just runs the state by himself for the next two years. He gets loans from Republican county governments, private banks. Fuller calls it in his biography a period of one-man rule. So he's doing a lot more than Governor Holcomb was doing this past pandemic. Fuller says what we're seeing now is unique because it's a Republican legislature fighting with the Republican governor. But we can really thank Oliver Morton for kind of putting us in this position and really lifting up those governor's powers. It's also a legacy of Oliver Morton. And I think that that's something we can remember and that, that's for that struggle that we continue to have in Indiana. And I think we still will have going forward how much power belongs in which party in which which house which branch of the government should have it and how, where are the limits of that power mitch i imagine it's a battle future governors and legislators will have as well yes yeah, so it's going to keep going <laughs> thank you thanks joe well many industries came to a standstill during the pandemic but the home construction business has been booming across indiana adam pinsker tells us what's driving the demand there is no rest for the weary, even during a pandemic. I'm busy every day and busy into the night sometimes, but uh, you do what you can do every day to keep things flowing. Rick David is overseeing construction of this western Monroe County home, which began last fall and is expected to be finished in June. Right now I've got uh, four other homes under construction, uh, a few here in Spencer, Indiana, <clears throat> one in Coatesville, Indiana, and one also in Martinsville. While demand for new homes is increasing, supply for the materials to build them hasn't been there. A lot of the lumber mills assumed that because of the pandemic that there would be a slowdown in the economy, thus a slowdown in housing. So they sent a lot of their workers home like a lot of companies did. Paul Schwinghammer is vice president of the Indiana Builders Association. He also owns Hallmark Homes. He says the lumber mills are still trying to keep pace with demand. Lumber is a commodity product, so it does fluctuate just like uh, gasoline prices do. Uh, however, we've never seen it uh, sustain on a complete upward trend like it's been doing the past 12 or 18 months even. The conventional home in Indiana is built with hundreds if not thousands of these studs, the price of which has been increasing since last year. A standard 2 by 4 stud has gone from uh, a little over a year ago from $1.99 to now over $7. The skyrocketing cost of these raw materials is showing up on the price tag of a finished home, up about $47,000 for an average 1,800 square foot dwelling. According to Swinghammer, the amenities inside your home will also cost more. Anything made with wood, cabinets, trim work, moldings, windows, all these things are going up. Aluminum products, and think about all the things that are made out of aluminum and steel in your home appliances, lighting fixtures, doorknobs. There is also a run on engineered components such as joints and lumber that make up the floor system. More so we've seen the availability uh, shrink on us as far as the availability of siding, uh, roofing, things like that. They are actually um, discontinuing certain colors of siding so they can concentrate on making only these five. David says prices of these materials increase after the buyer signs a contract for the home to be built, but his company doesn't pass those costs on to the consumer. There is no end in sight to the price spike, but with interest rates low, waiting to buy a home could be risky. I've never advocated 
uh, advising anyone to wait because you just don't know what's going to happen. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Adam Pinsker. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Bloomington will be adding more than 75 no turn on red signs as part of a push to improve pedestrian and biker safety. And I sit down with Bloomington best-selling author Michael Corita. A movie based on his book, Those Who Wish Me Dead, comes out in theaters today. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. Ready to watch the best of PBS anytime, anywhere, on nearly any device? It's easy with the PBS Video app. Simply download the PBS Video app on your mobile or streaming device. Now you can watch the latest PBS episodes or catch up on the shows you missed, discover new favorites from PBS, and local content from your PBS station. Welcome to Amanpour on PBS. I'm Christiane Amanpour in London, giving you the global view. I've covered the world for nearly three decades and I'm dedicated to bringing you all the facts. Please join me for conversations with newsmakers, world leaders. Good to be with you, Christiane. Artists and writers, the people who define, change and challenge our world. That's Amanpour on PBS. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Well, your morning commute through Bloomington could end up taking a little longer. Last month, the city council passed an ordinance that will add more than 70 no turn on red signs at intersections around town. Mitch Legan reports. If you're in tune with Bloomington City Council, you're probably familiar with Greg Alexander. That's not going to be easy, but you have to do it. You know, we got to walk. Walking is important. Alexander's a mainstay at local government meetings. He doesn't own a car and has had his fair share of close calls with vehicles around town, so he spent the last decade plus advocating pedestrian safety. But he says it hasn't produced many results from city officials. You know, about 15 or 20 years now, the city has had these plans again and again and again, and some of them, the plan was weak. It didn't have any teeth in it, and some of them, the plan just didn't happen. That's why he was excited to hear that Bloomington will be adding more no turn on red signs around town. He's been hit by cars three times, once by one turning right on red. So to Alexander, the signs are a small but solid step toward a safer city. It's so exciting to see somebody actually trying to put, you know, make it actually happen. Kate Rosenbarger is the city council member who sponsored the ordinance. This ordinance came about with some council members just talking to each other about ways we could make it safer for people biking and people walking. The ordinance will add nearly 80 no turn on red signs around downtown and at busy campus intersections. Rosenbarger says the additional signs will reduce the likelihood of crashes. When turning right, you're often looking to the left to keep an eye on oncoming traffic. That can mean you don't see the pedestrian crossing when you start your turn. This corner at South Washington and 3rd Street is one of the intersections that'll be getting a new no turn on red sign. Early 2020, an IU law student was killed here when a driver turning right on red didn't see her crossing the street. Since 2015, rights on red have led to five pedestrians being struck by vehicles in Bloomington. Rosenbarger says the ordinance's purpose is twofold. It'll make things safer for pedestrians and might encourage people to choose options other than driving. If we can make better options for folks, then they're more likely to say, hey, this is a great day to be walking and I feel safe doing it. The report from the City Traffic Commission pitches the signs as a way to advance Bloomington's comprehensive and transportation plans. It'll improve pedestrian access and prioritizes safety and accessibility over capacity. So is the city just trying to make it harder to drive downtown? I mean, I guess I pretty openly say I want to make it inconvenient to drive. I don't want to say ever that you can't drive. I want folks to be able to pick a different option and I want them to feel safe and happy doing it. So I don't think we're at a point where people are choosing walking and biking as much as we need. So it is about pushing for better options for people walking and biking. City estimates put the cost of the plan at about $8,000. Rosenbarger says after spending so much time and money focusing on drivers, it's important to continue improving infrastructure for pedestrians. That also makes the city greener. In the past couple years, we opted to spend $50 million on two brand new parking garages. 
I would not mind seeing $50 million spent on infrastructure for making it a lot safer for people biking and people walking and really increasing connectivity throughout the city. The ordinance has received some pushback from drivers, but staff reports say the impact will likely be minor and most felt during off hours when traffic isn't bad to begin with. As someone who was born deaf, Ayana Dandridge says more signs will make her more comfortable downtown with her young kids. They usually forget about that and single mothers with like two or more kids, you know, kids get away from you. They try to run across the street before you do. So the signs will really help. As for when the signs will start going up, the city didn't plan for the project in its 2021 budget, so it likely won't be until next year. But advocates are excited to see city officials taking steps to make Bloomington a greener, more pedestrian-friendly city. It's such a, a valuable step to acknowledge that we do need to, we don't just need to build the sidewalk, we need to slow down the cars. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Mitch Legan. Bloomington, Clarksville, and Union City will receive grants totaling $1.4 million to clean up contaminated properties. The Environmental Protection Agency says cleaning up so-called brownfield sites encourages development, promotes job growth, and raises property values. The biggest grant, $800,000, will go to the town of Clarksville near Louisville. They have plans to clean up properties along the Ohio River and say there is already investors interested in the land. Create a 400-acre public park uh, that would also uh, restore uh, natural wetlands and woodlands uh, along the river. Bloomington will receive about $300,000 to investigate environmental hazards in parts of downtown. Bloomington native IU alum and New York Times bestselling author Michael Corita is adding another title to his name, screenplay writer. His thriller novel, Those Who Wish Me Dead, premieres today in theaters nationwide and HBO Max, starring Angelina Jolie. Corita says the experience of going from novel to film went slow and painful. I think really the, the moment where everything achieved critical mass was when Jolie attached. It was sort of fascinating to, you grasp the theory of that, but to see how quickly a, a true A-list star moves the needle was, um, well, I'm just lucky, yeah, that, was that was something. So there were numerous times where I thought it was going to be made and it wasn't, and then the year we went into production, I had, I don't want to say given up hope, but my sense was, eh, you know, wait, it could be another long year of waiting. And then all of a sudden we were, we were off and um, got to go out on set and see it come to life. Wow. So the book came out though in 2014. Yeah. So when you write that book, were you thinking this could be a film? No, I think if I don't view them as completely separate mediums, it would be probably disaster. And I don't, I don't personally think it's a great way to to look at it anyhow. I know a lot of audience members say, well, I want to compare it to the book. And the one thing that they can never take away from me, if it's a great movie or a bad movie, my book is my book, you know? So I, just, I look at the movie as a, a compliment, not a competition, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you were on set during the filming. Yeah. How much were you involved? I was involved to the extent that they kept me as far away as possible. I mean, I think the the last person anyone wants to see when the filming adaptation of a book is underway is the writer of the book um, but actually taylor sheridan the director uh he was uh writer director he was very gracious i felt like he kind of went out of his way to um, make me feel welcome and yeah it's just it, it's a very surreal feeling to see someone Jolie is not just an you know, Oscar winning talent, she has one of those uniquely famous faces. And to, to watch her become the character that I had been imagining was um, it's really, really a special thing. You know, I learned uh, if the internet is correct, at the age of eight, you were writing authors. So That's you, right. You've been yes. doing this for a long time. What was your interest back then? As soon as I started reading, I wanted, and I, as soon as I had that moment of understanding that someone did that as a a day job. It just seemed like the, the world's greatest occupation. And that goes back to my parents were both big readers um, and they read for pleasure, which I think that can be easily overlooked. It, was, it wasn't something that I was encouraged to do in any, or coerced to do. It was just, um, you know, like going to a movie. It was something you did for fun. And I, I loved the idea of creating that world of story. So I've always wanted to do it.
You speak about Bloomington and IU. How much has Indiana had an impact on you? Well, that, that would be hard to quantify, but I know that it's huge. I mean, when I think back to mentors and teachers and friends, everyone who has ultimately you know, shaped my career or given me an opportunity that, that ended up being really good luck, that's, that's all here in town. You know, Don Johnson of Trace Investigations took me on as an intern in high school, which when I look back on that, he was really going out of his way. Bob Hamill uh, was a you know, huge influence, remains a, a huge influence. Michael Heffron, who is the general manager of the Herald Times, gave me my first job as a writer. So um, just an enormous outsized influence. It's a very literary community too. You know, it, it's, a, it's a town that loves books. Are there any hints of Bloomington or IU in any of your work? In the books, absolutely. Um, in, in this film, no. We were very fortunate finished filming So Cold the River, which that was shot all on location in West Baden and French Lick. So I'll get my Hoosier story out there, hopefully sooner than later. So Cold the River is still in post-production. It's directed by Paul Schulberg, who wrote and directed The Good Catholic, which was filmed in Bloomington in 2016. The Carmel Cottage is back making popcorn in Nashville after a fire in September closed the business. Videographer Joey Mendelia has this report. The popcorn, they started with an original and a cheese corn. I mean, that's when I came into the shop. I expanded it to pecans, walnuts, a double dip, Chicago style, which is a caramel and cheese, which, and a white cheese now, and a pickle, which is our fourth best seller. The Pope started it, <clears throat> this in 1978. They had a carnival in Paris, Illinois, where they did the popcorn in a machine like this and made the kettle there, had a slush puppy machine like that there, and then they moved out here in 78 and opened up this place here. This came up for sale and I bought it in 99. We had a fire in here in September and this is a cement block building with a metal roof so it was an oven in here and everything got destroyed. We were down for six months. A disaster turned into a blessing. The building is brand new. The only thing old in this building is me now. <laughs> this machine, turn it on, put popcorn inside, turn the fire on, because it's heated, heat, no oil in it, done by air, air, air pop. The pop comes out, takes it about 10 minutes to pop it off. When it's done, I'll have the caramel done in that copper kettle that I make from brown sugar and corn syrup. We dump the popcorn in there, dump, stir it up 50 times, dump it in a cooling tray in back, right in back here, cool it down, then we bag it like this here. People are, that are coming in now are, I'm hearing all the time, so glad you're open again, you know, so that makes you feel good. Well, you're not seeing things if you spot a parrot biking along the Beeline Trail or dancing at the farmer's market. It's just Charlie Bird. Holden Ebshire reports. Charlie Bird has been living with Joe Porowski for the last 18 years, and you've probably seen them biking around town together. Charlie is a 39-year-old green-winged macaw who previously lived in Bedford. Porowski says Charlie's original owner did not have provisions set up for him after he died. Charlie somehow got to Bloomington with a man that I was working with. And after a couple of years, it didn't work out with the two of them. And when Charlie started to pluck his feathers is when I decided to take him myself. In 2018, Charlie almost died due to an avian virus, but received life-saving support from a specialist in Louisville. Now he takes two daily medications and the care for the remainder of his life is estimated at over $25,000. Given Charlie is expected to live another 40 years, Porowski is writing a children's book to help cover his lifetime of medical bills. The book is called Charlie Bird Loves Bloomington, 
and it features Charlie and Porowski doing their favorite activities around town, whether it's biking the Beeline Trail or dancing at the farmer's market. In fact, Charlie's done them all without ever trying to fly away. He seems to love it. We have probably gone at least a thousand miles around Bloomington, and that led to riding a sled, riding a paddleboard, kayaking, hiking, all the things that we do, he comes along with me. Bloomington local Sarah Millward and Winnie King are writing the book, which is set for release in August. Charlie is a big show off. He's the biggest ham in the world. And the fact that we have an audience around us almost anywhere we go just simply delights him. The book is funded by a Kickstart campaign, which currently has 138 backers. The original goal was $2,700, but more than $5,000 has already been raised in less than a month. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Holden Absher. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUNews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.